Okay. Um, as we mentioned, we're, this is James Tanner. We're at the BYU Family History Library. And uh, we are going to talk about highlights of Roots Tech. Roots Tech is a uh, vast uh, conference that's been held for many, many years. And I'll get into that information. So we'll get to look at some of that a little bit here. This year's Roots Tech was called Choose Connection, as was the theme. And the idea of the Roots Tech Conference uh, now and during the last two, two conferences, we can say the conference is over, so there are last two for 21 and 22. The um, uh, conference is to connect, and it's been called Roots Tech Connect. And they've uh, gone out all around the world uh, finding uh, extremely interesting and very helpful examples of people who have connected and, and understand the connection of family and the importance of family. And so it is, uh, some of them are very touching. Uh, some of them are uh, very interesting. And uh, most of those presentations, as I will mention a number of times to keep everybody on track, are now available on the on the Family Search YouTube channel. So you go to youtube.com and um, and look for Family Search channel, the Family Search channel, and that will have all of those um, the the new videos. In addition, uh, you'll be able to access the rest of the the um, content, all the sessions and the exhibitors and things through the rootstech.org website. So we'll get into that and I'll talk about it. So the website is roots, rootstech.org. And um, the you just simply have to do that. You will have to register. And when you register, uh, you're actually registering for a family search account. So if you register for rootstech, you will also be registered for familysearch.org. And so that's sort of a, another benefit of the conference. Uh, Roots Tech started back in 2011 and in, uh, in a conference. And at the first Roots Tech con conference, there were about 3,000 people in attendance. Um, I was one of those people back at that in those days, as, as uh, some of you may want to know. Uh, I am a blogger, and I have been blogging now for many, many years lot longer than 12 years. And um, I, um, I was asked or invited to be a um, uh, blogger at the Roots Tech, first Roots Tech conference. And we got some kind of really royal re uh, uh, treatment. We had uh, tours and we had uh, dinners and we got to do the tour of the floor early and all sorts of things like that. It was very impressive and we had a really good time. Uh, and some of the bloggers uh, over the years have become my uh, good online friends. And we have uh, the group of people that were there originally, which was only about 12 or 15, maybe, maybe a few more, but about a dozen or so people. And those people, now are all old and gray. <laughs> we weren't old, we weren't exactly young at the time, but most of us are, uh, uh, a lot of them have uh, kind of retired from the blogging, from blogging. And so we are uh, a very small group of people left who were the original ambassadors. They've been, they began calling them uh, from ambassadors. They began call, I mean, excuse me, from uh, bloggers. They began calling them ambassadors and then they changed the name recently to innovators or um, not in innovators, um, influencers. That's the word. I never could get that word. That's, that's not a word I use. It's not influencer, but we are influencers now. So that's kind of the, the way that it stretched through. Uh, Roots Tech Connect uh, went live on March 2nd at 6 o'clock 6, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I, if you are watching the, the, all of the announcements for Roots Tech, you'll know, know that the announcement said that it started on March 3rd. 
this is probably the biggest um, example of uh, the globalization and internationalization of this whole project in that March 2nd was March 3rd. So in other words, 6 p.m. March 2nd was, was chosen because that would put those people who were uh, on uh, around the world would have been watching it on, on uh, Friday morning. But uh, not all of the things, uh, not all of the parts of the, uh, of the website went active on uh, March 2nd. <clears throat> there was only a few things that were missing, but those things started pretty heavily on March 3rd at, at uh, about 10 a.m. in the morning. So this early start accommodated all those people around the world because they got access to the sessions, they got access to the website and, and some of the uh, presentations that were available. Um, this is another question that came up last year. It was a little bit uncertain whether and how long uh, the different sessions would stay online. Uh, if you had a Roots Tech presentation uh, and it was uh, and it was online and, and going to at the Roots Tech conference, the questions that we all had <clears throat> was how long are these going to be kept um, available? And the answer was very simple. Uh, they said we don't know. And so then over the course of the last year, uh, they kept extending the time that they were available. And finally, they just said, oh, they're going to be available for till next year at least. And so we still don't know the, the status of the <clears throat> older, <clears throat> excuse me, of the older um, uh, sessions from 2021, but all of the ones from 2022, the, the new set of them and there's well over a thousand of these so we're talking more than most people even if you watched it all day long every day it'd be a full-time job uh, going through all of the the roots tech presentations so basically what happens is that um, these will be online and the, the website will be up <clears throat> and and usable for those who are registered for the entire next year till 2023 and all they did said about 2023 this year uh, in the closing, uh, which by the way was broadcast from um, um, where? Dubai. Oh, Dubai, that's right. Okay, I'm sorry, my brain is, is not functioning as fast as it should today, <laughs> which was kind of unusual because we're talking about a, a, a part of the conference that was coming from all the way around the other side of the world too. So that was the, that it will be available on the rootstech.org website and or the family search channel on YouTube. So you kind of have to check both. Uh, I've noticed that you can't get to the uh, uh, main stage presentations, the keynotes uh, by going to the website, but you can get them on the family search channel, YouTube channel. So um, it's, you know, it's just, Basically, there's two places to look, and they there may be some of the, the videos. Now, some of the videos on the website are viewable on YouTube, but they're not visible on YouTube. So you have to watch them through the um, Roots Tech website. So it's kind of confusing, but it boils down to being quite simple that there's only two places to look. And one is to do a search on YouTube for Family Search and look at their channel, and you'll see um, a lot of the videos. Um, basically, what were the main attractions of the conference uh, and the resulting website? And these are, and we will go through all of those things that we're going to see. First of all, we had all the keynote speakers. and. Um, uh, during Roots Tech, uh, both my wife and I were extremely busy doing a lot of different things that have not a lot to do with watching all of these presentations. It's kind of what we had to do when we were attending in person, and that was we were busy talking to people, and we were busy uh, uh, recording and uh, publicizing what was going on. 
So I published um, uh, quite a few blog posts during the three days of the conference. And uh, so I haven't gotten around to seeing all these, but I have really enjoyed the ones that I've watched so far, and they are amazing people. So that's one thing you can do. And I know those are on the Family Search uh, YouTube channel. So you might want to look on Family Search on the YouTube channel for those. The main stage uh, was the, the place where they also had a lot of, um, they had the sponsor um, presentations and uh, those will be available uh, kind of scattered around depending on the sponsor. So. Uh, if you're looking at a sponsor and want to know what happened with Ancestry, I would suggest you go to the Ancestry blog and, uh, and see what all their new announcements are. And if you're looking for MyHeritage, you go to the MyHeritage blog and see where all, what all their theirs are. So there's uh, a lot of places, but uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of those uh, presentations, I didn't uh, uh, go through all of the the process of looking, but the I'm not sure how many of the exhibitors are still online on the Roots Tech. But their, their booth should still be available. We'll talk about that in a minute. Obviously, the idea here was to connect uh, with people around the world. And um, one of the popular features was called Root Relatives at Roots Tech. There is also some other, you know, there's programs that let you view your relatives that are connected by a family tree, such as the family search family tree. And uh, in this case, uh, some of us signed in to that and uh, looked at our relatives. And I'll show you what happened in a moment, but I'm going to finish with this. There's also a surname search with a, to search for a friend on Roots Tech. And there's some are related, are you related? Uh, uh, web functions here that tells you whether you're related to a specific person. Now, all of these are, are, are functions of different kinds of apps. And the apps that do this are, are originating primarily, uh, they originated primarily first at the Brigham Young University Family History Technology Lab. Now, that's a long name, but if you look up BYU Family History Technology Lab, you'll find that they have these apps there. They have this, are you related to a famous person? And they have the, um, and surname searches are, are, uh, are fairly simple, but uh, not, and not, and from a genealogical standpoint, they're interesting, but not helpful. And rel because we're not related to all the people with our surname, usually, unless you have an extremely unusual surname, uh, it, is, it is highly likely that there are many other people with that surname that you, you're not related to. For example, Tanner is an occupational surname and many people from England and Switzerland and Germany actually have that name. And I'm not related to, to the vast majority of those people. Um, Relatives at Roots Tech is, uh, is also an app and it's available uh, in, on the, actually on the Family Search um, uh, mobile app that's uh, mobile on, uh, on Android and on iOS. And you can uh, be in a group and have everybody get on their phones and you can see all of the relatives that are around you if there are any and it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. It's quite an impressive thing actually. Um, but to do that at Roots Tech, when you have that many people ended up um, basically with this, this is the, uh, this is the try it on the Roots Tech. And, and it's probably still on there because they're allowing people to uh, some time to connect and uh, find some of their relatives using this. But I'm, you might end up with quite a few relatives. This is, this is how many I ended up with. I've heard numbers they were considerably larger than these, uh, than this number. Uh, but uh, uh, finding out that you have 32,000 or almost 33,000 close, you know, relatives, uh, it can either be uh, very expansive and a great experience or something somewhat intimidating and also uh, somewhat hopelessly 
wondering how in the world you would ever know who these people were. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the the issue, but it is quite interesting. And as a matter of fact, one of the people who came on on my relatives uh, on Roots Tech uh, was had a name, and I didn't, and we didn't recognize who the person was. And so I just contacted them through Roots Tech and said, "Who are you?" And um, I'm just wondering. And it came back, and yes, it was one of my nieces that I didn't recognize that that was her name. So uh, that's the kind of thing that you might uh, that you might end up finding. Uh, there are more than a thousand sessions of classes and workshops and activities, and these are all uh, recorded. Uh, they mentioned before we started that I had done one. Um, the question is, why would I do one or more or whatever? Preparing and doing a uh, presentation for Roots Tech was not as simple as it would be to do something like for the BYU classes or all the webinars and things that I do, because there's a lot of things you have to go for. You have to go through sign agreements and you have to do all sorts of things. And they have to review them and you have to be careful that you don't say anything that's you know offensive to anybody. It goes on and on. And uh, so it's a process. And so I just went through the process with one video this year. But that doesn't mean that's the only video I have on, <laughs> on uh, the Roots Tech website. Uh, if you keep looking, you'll probably run across me in a lot of other places, particularly the Family History Guide and uh, the GEDCOM Steering Committee. Those are the two places where I had more, more videos. And you may, and I might pop up on other things, who knows. But this one video, as they mentioned earlier, had already received about over 1,300 views in three days, which is pretty phenomenal for genealogy, uh, at least from my experience. So uh, I'm sure some of the main other, other, uh, other areas of more interest probably got more. But you can see the worldwide scope of this because of the numbers of people that are involved in, uh, in, in watching and, and being involved with the, with the conference. So you can search for a title for a presenter or a subject. So there's, you can search through all of them. They have, this will search the uh, 2021 um, sessions also. So there's uh, 1500 sessions. I think some of them have been taken down, uh, but uh, there's a huge number of, of places to look and to um, uh, discover what you're interested in. The Expo Hall is where everybody, all of the, the businesses are, nonprofits and for profit companies. So they are selling products in a case, in each case. They want you to view their website or view their or buy their product. But this is not bad. This is, this is part of what makes uh, Roots Tech possible because the people who are in the Expo Hall are the people who are supporting um, the, the conference. And in that, case, in that way, they are um, uh, spending some money uh, with the hope that you will look at and uh, perhaps use some of their products. And this is where some of the most innovative things are found. There's a, an also an innovators session that you can get into that will, uh, that will get into people who are working on, on projects that are uh, far advanced. But we're gonna see some things, I'll go show some things today, which I thought were the highlights of uh, the most, some of the most, let's say important um, additions to the genealogical universal the worldwide journal genealogical community. Okay, so here are some of those announcements. The first one, I think that uh, a lot of people would be interested in in the United States and perhaps in somewhat in other countries, but not so much, is the uh, indexing and uh, advent of the 1950 census. And that will not be coming out until April 1st. So it's going to be, it's just a little, almost a month away. And, uh, but we're getting ready and have been getting ready for some time 
to be involved directly in the census. Now, the 1950 census is a little bit different for some of us because this is the first time that some of us show up in the census. So I will probably, since I was born quite a distant, quite before 1950, I will show up in the census as will some of a lot of my contemporaries. And so from that standpoint, it's, it's pretty interesting. From a genealogical standpoint, it's interesting because it always brings, every time you bring a census forward 10 years, uh, you get a whole uh, additional amount of information. And a lot of that information helps you resolve problems that go back maybe many way past the, the difference. So and it, and you may find information in the 1950 census which will help you resolve your relationship issues that go back uh, by, by the way the connections are back into the 1800s or earlier. So it's, it's a valuable tool uh, for uh, adding additional information to, our, to what we already know, but also get adding information about people that we maybe do not know and can have not been able to find previously. So we always think about the loss of the 1890 census because uh, for those of you who use the census uh, frequently and understand the process of adding census records to every person who appears in any one of the US censuses or any one of the British censuses or whatever other country there are census records, then you'll understand the process and how disappointing it is to, to say, oh, if we just had that one more year to to 1890, we would have picked up additional family members and we could have verified this family more easily. And that's exactly what's happening here with the 1950 census. We have a 1940 census and we may not have been able to resolve some of the uh, people who were living at that time, but they will either appear in the 1950 census or disappear. And uh, that may be helpful in, in other ways. Sometimes we know if a person did not survive to Till the 1950 census that that would be uh, uh, helpful information. So this is a great process and what's happening is that family search has um, connected with ancestry. They've formed a partnership to work on the 1950 census. So ancestry has been anticipating this for a long time and uh, has been doing some other things, as have many of the other organizations, including Family Search, and the BYU Family History Library, excuse me, BYU Family uh, History Technology Lab on the BYU campus. They've all been working on, uh, and other people around the world, lots of people have been working on handwriting recognition. This has been the big, the big issue with, um, uh, finding and indexing old records. Uh, it's nice to have a lot of volunteers. It's nice that uh, some of the larger uh, websites can pay people around the world to um, uh, index records and index these handwritten records. But there's in, in, handwritten records like probate records, for example, are just mammoth. I mean, there are, uh, you know, you can have a probate file that is, uh, that has hundreds of images, hundreds and hundreds of images in one file. And to go through that and pick out all the names of all the people who are there in that particular file is, is, a, is a major undertaking. And uh, for that reason, very, very, very few probate records have been digitized at any depth. I mean, excuse me, indexed, even, the, even though they're digitized, they have not been indexed at any depth, which means that uh, we have to go through them page by page and read every page. Well, we still have to go through and read every page. Indexes do not excuse uh, a researcher from, from looking at every page, but we may be able to find the documents that have our, the people that we're looking for, our ancestors or relatives names more quickly if we have an index. And so making an index is important. Through artificial intelligence and the computer development of the computers, handwriting recognition at the level that it is going to be impactful on genealogy is now the present. I've been, I've been doing for 
20 years easily, I have been going back and forth trying to find out when we were going to have handwriting recognition to the level that it would be useful for genealogical purposes. And here it is today, 22, 2022, we've got the, the product. And uh, uh, Ancestry has developed their, art of their handwriting recognition and Family Search is going to provide uh, a backup to that. And what the backup is, is that we will be able to look at and correct or um, affirm the, the fact that the handwriting recognition is correct. And they have developed an app, which is on your phone. And uh, you can download it. And uh, that, uh, that app will let you immediately get involved in looking at a set of records. It's sort of like indexing except you're not being asked to, to um, write out or recover the records. You're just being asked to give, to, to say, is this correct? And if it isn't, to correct it. And if you can't correct it because you can't read it, you just say, I can't do that. And so it's a very fast process and should, uh, and as more people get involved in that, let me stay back here for a second. As more people get involved in that, it will be a great benefit to the, the uh, uh, genealogical community because a lot of these records, uh, the records by, for example, are that are being digitized and uh, indexed by computer for Latin America. Uh, they've been, there are millions and millions of records that have been done and they can go through and do the recognition on millions of records in a matter of a few hours instead of like years. And so this is, this is just an amazing process. And I would recommend that everybody get involved in this uh, digitization project and, and this uh, by using the app and uh, clicking away. Gives you something to do besides reading the news while you're waiting at the doctor's office or wherever you have to wait. You can just get on and you can do 10 names in about three minutes unless it gets really hard and then you can just say, I can't do this. Okay, now the big news on the, from the, the vendors side and from the development of, of new, new um, products came from MyHeritage. And MyHeritage has always been the leader for many, many years um, of, in the technology area of, of family history. And this year, the big news was live story. Now, you may have, maybe you're familiar or not, but you may know that MyHeritage has a very sophisticated uh, photographic process that you can do for any photograph you upload. You can have them um, may, uh, enhance the photo, you can colorize the photo. And then the last thing they added was that you could add some animation to the photo. Well, this carries the animation much further and so I'm going to just uh, story. So you, when you go to live story, you have to have your photos and you have to be registered. Obviously, you have to register on, on, on uh, MyHeritage. You can register for free. There's no obligation, but you need to be registered. Then you can upload your photos uh, to uh, MyHeritage. And uh, during this time period, at least for the moment, uh, it's a free upload. And you're able to use this live story uh, program. And this is what it looks like. So this is one that we worked on um, with, I worked on with my heritage before the conference. Um, yes, if you keep listening, you get tired because I get involved in a lot of different things that are really strange sometimes. And uh, basically we went back and forth for a couple of weeks or more uh, until we got this working and they, at the same time, we're working with others. And so if you go into their product uh, to the live story page and look at their gallery, you'll find this video among a, a few very impressive others. But we'll go into this one. Elder Tanner, they're saying, should there be sound? Nobody can hear anything. Oh, I can't hear it? No. Oh, 
Okay, well, let's see. Let's go back. Let me, uh, I guess I could switch. Let me switch real quick. I'm gonna just switch the, um, the audio. And then you should be able to, to um, may not get as good an audio, but we'll be able to hear. Okay, this should let you hear it. Let's you have to share your screen. I have to share my screen again. Uh, oh, it's shared. I just have to do a new share. And I have to go to play from present slide. Okay, let's start. Hi, out. I'm Leroy Parkinson Tanner. I'm happy for this opportunity to tell you a bit about myself and my family. I was born on January 12, 1895, in Navajo County, Arizona. Do you, can you hear that now? Yes. Okay, let me go back to it. And we'll, we'll start it again and we'll get, go through with it. Oops. You may want to turn it down just a hair. It's a little bit overwhelming. Okay, I'll pull it down. It's hard to tell what's happening. It's, it's, this is kind of an a innovative kind of um, what I'm trying to show. So let's see how it happens. Let me go back to him there. Now we'll try it. Up. Oh, gotta go more back there. Now we'll go. Hi, I'm Leroy Parkinson Tanner. I'm happy for this opportunity to tell you a bit about myself and my family. I was born on January 12, 1895 in Navajo County, Arizona. My father, Henry Martin Tanner, was born on June 11, 1852, in Los Angeles, California. His occupations were LDS missionary to England, Sunday school superintendent, St. Joseph Ward Bishopric, farmer, freighter, and stock raiser. My mother, Eliza Ellen Parkinson, was born on September 8, 1857, in San Bernardino, California. Her occupation was housekeeping. When they married in 1877, my mother was five years younger than my father. I took Eva Margaret Oberson as my wife on August 26, 1923, at age 28 in St. John's, Arizona. She was 26 years old when we married, two years younger than I. We had two boys. My eldest son, Wallace, was born on August 12, 1924, in St. John's, when I was 29 years old. That was a day to remember. He married Jesse Maxine Morgan on September 12, 1944, at age 20 in St. John's. My son Lee was born on April 13, 1929, in St. John's. Throughout his life, he married three times and had five children. My wife, Eva Margaret, passed away on December 30, 1932, at the young age of 35. A couple of years later, I married Clara Beth Peterson on October 14, 1934, at age 39 in St. John's. She was 25 years old when we married, 14 years younger than I. I served as a soldier under General John J. Pershing and then 2nd Lieutenant George Patton in the Mexican Border War and later served during World War I and I was sent to France but got there just about the time of the armistice. I had 11 grandchildren, James, Margaret, Jesse, David, Sidney and Morgan for my son Wallace, and five more from my son Lee. There are so many more memories to share, but I'm glad I got to share my story with you. Thanks for listening. Okay, so let's go Hi. on. To the, let's go on to the next. <laughs> Can you hear me now, still? Yes. Okay, good. Um, all of you, that kind of a video, that's exactly what you can do. When you have a photo, you have to have the information, obviously, in your family tree on, on MyHeritage for them to use that information. But they will generate from your family tree on MyHeritage. They will generate that kind of a presentation on any of the ancestors that you have. They're fully editable. You can rewrite the script. You can choose the photos you want to use. You can go in and, and change it in the ways that you want it to have it changed. And so, I mean, it's just an amazing, and it's all part of the package of stuff that you get as a, with a MyHeritage subscription. So it's, uh, it's an amazing, it's amazing process. So that's just one of the things that they had. Uh, basically, they, they are also having a uh, US Census project and they have created a US Census hub 
and they will have a copy of indexed copy of the census and they may beat everybody to it. They've done it in the past, um, even though uh, it's gonna be hard to beat anc uh, ancestry with their uh, uh, artificial intelligence recognition process, but I'm pretty sure that my heritage will be pretty, pretty close on their heels of having all of the census, but they're creating a hub where you can search uh, all of the census records. Um, and so it's uh, called the US Census Content Hub. And uh, so that content hub will let you ser search all of the US Census records on uh, MyHeritage at one time. It'll be, make it a, a census specific search. The next thing they've introduced is a timeline. Um, this isn't like the timeline that you would see on many of the other programs. It is a timeline where it shows that the life, the lifetime of each person, the birth and death years, and they overlap and show how people, um, how people are related to each other, but not only related to each other by the uh, the time that's shown of their life. So you can see what what how old they were when they died, and then you can see. Well, I'm not dead yet, so I'm still on there, but. Um, you can see who I've outlived, which is all of those people, by the way. And so basically what you can see also is that if you have someone who doesn't fit in the family, it'll be very, very obvious, very obvious that they aren't that they aren't part of that family. It's it's uh, you play around with it a lot. It's an amazing tool. It's on my heritage. Uh, this is another this is from Ancestry. You can see the little logo down in the bottom. And these are their developments. They have a tree sharing development. Uh, you, so you can invite members to build a tree together. That's been around for quite a while, but they're building on that. They're also, uh, in, they have also incorporated a scanning program within uh, uh, Ancestry. That's uh, a partnership with a company called Photomine. And they have basically added that you can use your, your phone to scan documents directly into uh, Ancestry. Now, you'll know that you can scan documents into the memory section of uh, Family Search, and you can also uh, upload and scan photos uh, in some of the other websites. But this is a new innovation for Ancestry. And they also have added some colorization and restore and enhance features. Now they're not all, I wasn't able to find them yet. Um, and I would assume that they would be added over time, but this is their, their timeline of adding all of that kind of information. So this is the scan photos app, as it appears. Uh, you can basically uh, go to the app and uh, in three steps, you can scan. Some things that it does that are helpful is that if you're scanning a, a, a photographic album page that has multiple photos, it will scan each of the photos, but then make them individually. It'll just split your all your photos up off of a photo, off of a photo page. Um, I haven't tried it with just putting a bunch of photos out, like six photos out, and seeing if it'll scan all six at the same time. Uh, but uh, it may it may possibly do that. If it does, then this is going to be a very interesting. Uh, process. We might want to, it's a beta and I've only had a couple of days to even think about it. So I'll be a while before and I'll be writing more about this and talking more about it. Also want to point out that uh, there are some innovative products that you may not be uh, totally aware of or uh, that you wouldn't even know to look at. This one is called Goldie May. And uh, there's a statement down there that this is the coolest tune I've seen in 40 years. And I would, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say it's the coolest tool, but it's one of the most useful tools that I've seen come out in the last 40 years of doing genealogy. So uh, you can go to their website, it's goldiemay.com. And, uh, and this is the, oh, let me go back. Goldie May, this is called the Subway feature, and this is a new feature. Now, Goldie May is a freemium program. It has a free free version, 
and then it has a premium version and it has a pro version. So you have kind of three levels. Uh, it would be if you if you get into the program and you understand what it's doing, you may very well decide that it is uh, the kind of tool that you will use continually, and it will tell you um, some things really rapidly that take me a lot of time. And let me just kind of explain. This is the subway map, and basically what this feature does is it is part of Family Search. It is a Family Search app. And so it's a Chrome app. So it works in Chrome, but when you open Family Search and bring up your family tree and choose an individual, the program will automatically begin adding information for that individual. Uh, it will give you a research assistance. It does uh, all has all sorts of features that I don't have time to go into today at all. But uh, one of the features that I wanted to highlight was the subway map. And this will this is part of their premium version, but uh, basically what this does is it allows you to uh, it will go in and automatically plot all the events in an ancestor's life. So let me explain how this works. If I were uh, looking at uh, one of my ancestors and I wondered uh, if all of the all of the sources were consistent. And if the information in the in that file was consistent, so it's something I do over and over and over again. It's it's a it's one of the most common activities that I'm involved in because every time I click on an individual, I have to look at all their sources individually. I have to sit down and think about the time on each one of the four sources, whether that agrees with what's in the uh, program in Family Search. Or, uh, and then I have to compare all of that to all of the other members of that particular family. So I have to start out with child number one and see when they lived and when they died and where all the things happened in there and what kind of sources they had. And then I have to go to child number two and do the same thing over again. And by looking at a family like that can take me, oh, I'm not going to say it's going to take very long because I can do this very quickly after having done it a few thousand times. And so I can go through and look at all the information. And then I have to kind of go back and forth and back and forth, open multiple screens and try and compare to see if all these children actually add up correctly, if they're all born in the right place, if they all have all the same information. Okay, so you take all that process that I just kind of summarized and you put it together in one place at one time by clicking once and that's what goldie may does it takes all the information from the sources you have in family search all of the events that have dates and all the places of all those events and then it plots them on the map on a time scale map that shows you the time that it was involved and so as you're looking at this process, first of all, it may seem very, very confusing, but I'm, you can do these one by one. You don't have to do them all at once, but you can do them all at once. And what it will show is it's what shows automatically. It shows what are called outliers. And uh, uh, how that happened is in this particular one that's on the screen, if you look up near the top, uh, there's a couple of people that uh, are in Hartford, Connecticut colony, and then there's a couple in Massachusetts, and then everyone else down in the in the list, all the way down the whole list, are in Massachusetts, eventually ending up in Vermont and Indiana and other places. Now, none of that is inconsistent, except the two first people are born in the same year, and you get that information just by hovering over the little dots. And so in a few minutes, that would take me a considerable period of time, I have all the information I need from a family and all the children in the family that I can then analyze whether or not one of those people is actually not a member of that family or more people are not members. And I can tell you that this is, I've already sat down with before this was actually officially reintroduced, I got a chance to look at the program 
and I sat down with one of the one of my friends who came in and had a very involved question, and we were able to very quickly determine that the people that she suspected were not part of the family were in fact not part of the family. So this is the same thing that a lot of people do with spreadsheets and and uh, all sorts of other kinds of tools that they've used to do this. And this just collapses all of that into one um, major way of looking at families. So I'm using this as an example because this is the kind of thing that you will find that may hit your be may exactly what you're looking for or something that changes the way that you do your research in a dramatic way uh, uh, and i have a suspicion that uh, that i'm going to be seeing a lot more of these charts uh, because i have this problem that occurs just continually and it, and i think that as i set it up and so it's it's basically an app that works you have your screen open to your family search you simply click on an individual and they show up in Goldie May and you can begin to use all these tools. Now, the additional thing that's helpful here is that in some cases, uh, if there are records available, for example, Goldie May will say, well, you have the 1920 uh, census, but you're missing and they'll have the 1910 uh, to 1900. They'll show you which, which records are missing on any particular person. Uh, what you need to do for additional research. Uh, very, very uh, efficient way to, um, to analyze the information. And, and it's, uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that when you have, uh, when you work with it, and when you work with, uh, when you're doing your research, you may all of a sudden discover that, that this tool will actually uh, do something that you couldn't do previously as quickly or as easily. Okay, so Elder Tanner, before you go on, there's a question: Is it can Goldie may be used with other programs other than Family Search? No, it's a Family Ancestry. Search app. It, oh, it works with Ancestry also. Yeah, Ancestry and Family Search. I'm sorry. So it's an uh, you know it's just to, it'll do the same kinds of things for Ancestry, and tell you who the outliers are, the people who don't really belong in that family, but it's more. It's also extremely helpful for the suggestions of the records that it says you need to search these records. And so it gives you the specific records to look for. Um, I mean, it's, it goes well beyond everything that I've said because it's, it's, um, it's more, it has more features than, than I could cover. I'd have to spend the whole hours talking about it because it's uh, amazing, uh, an amazing help. Unfortunately, of course, for some people, um, we have groups of people in, in genealogy, of course, who uh, think that all genealogy should be free, and so they don't want to pay for anything. But uh, on the other hand, some of us understand that our time is, is worth some money, and that if it costs something to collapse the time that, we have, that we've been spending doing it, something that is not necessary, then that uh, is a great benefit. This one, uh, the next product is the shot box, and this has been around for quite a while, but uh, many people might not be aware of it. And I just uh, thought it was something that we should be highlighting. I have had a couple of these. Uh, I bought one of the very first ones, and then I was uh, uh, provided one uh, by the by the uh, uh, developers uh, for evaluation and, and comment, and so I helped them with uh, with some of the comments about it and what what how to get it developed and it is a um it's a light room it's a light uh, uh, box as they call them from uh, photography what it does is erases shadows so if you're trying to take pictures of of objects um whatever any kind of an object toys figurines dolls models whatever it is you're doing you put it in the shot box and it, and it erases all the shadows and you have a, a perfect picture that you uh, would see on a commercial from a commercial standpoint. It also is a very efficient way to do uh, scanning with a camera. You can mount a uh, 35 millimeter camera on it. It is set up to work very well with a, uh, a smartphone camera. 
but it uh, the advantage is it gives you uniform uh, lighting over the entire product. Um, the only limitation is its size. You're not going to be able to do very large items, but you can do um, uh, some uh, quite a few amazing atoms. There's lots of other options on the shotbox.me uh, website. Um, I would just encourage everyone to continue to sign in and experience all of the sessions, just all you can. Use this as a tool. Um, I remind you, of course, we have about 700 of our own videos on BYU Family History Library YouTube channel also. So yeah, there's a lot out there now, a few thousand of them to look at. So uh, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we've really got a lot of information and training out there, and it's, uh, it, it's really helpful to get involved with the training. Um, we've spent, uh, I've spent a considerable time over the last couple of years learning how to do videos in more depth and the best part of that has been almost all of that has been available online uh, through uh, through video education so i can actually see how it's done and hear it explained and then i can go try it and i can stop the video and i can go back and try it again so this is a, an amazing way to uh, that we've gotten and uh, rootstick has given us a huge amount more and so we really have now an entire world of, of information that we can uh, work with. Sorry about that. Okay, well, thanks for watching. I know we had a little bit of a going back and forth there with that one video part.